Hi guys, welcome and thank you for joining. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Donna Chow, and I'm your host and your moderator for today's eLotus webinar. eLotus is your leading provider of continuing education for acupuncturists. Today's webinar is numerology and acupuncture point combinations, five spirit connections, presented by David Hartman. This is the final course of a four-part series on numerology and acupuncture point combinations. So to get the most out of the series, be sure to watch his previous courses if you haven't already, and they are all available as CEU video recording. Even better, I do recommend the Goal Pass membership, which grants you to free access to all of his past courses, as well as unlimited CEUs and free herbs. I'll send you a link to what thousands of your colleagues have already joined and learned from different master's protocols that have transport, transformed their practice into the dream practice they have always desired. Today's webinar will be from 9 to 6 p.m. Pacific time. We will have four breaks and one lunch from 1 to 2 p.m. Download your lecture notes directly from your eLotus account, Blue Course Access page. And set your preference to everyone so that everyone can see what you're typing and participate in the conversation. And if you have any questions for David, please type them to the Q&A box. And finally, the quiz and video replay. They'll be ready tomorrow for you guys, and I will send an email out when they are ready. So today's webinar, our speaker is David Hartman, and he has been licensed as a Chinese medicine practitioner in Brisbane, Australia since 1997. David is well known for his acupuncture point combinations, for which he has also written a textbook. He has taught classes on five spirits, emotions, and mental well-being, as well as five element archetypes and five spirits acupuncture here at eLotus. And all of these are now available for purchase as a distant learning CU video recording through eLotus.org. When I get back to my computer, I'll post the link for you guys. David's presence here today is an incredible honor and privilege. And so without further ado, you guys, let's go ahead and give David a big warm welcome. David, please go ahead and take over and share your PowerPoint. Thank you, Donna, you are darling. Um, yeah, welcome. Welcome everyone. I, um, yeah, again, very excited to be here and get this opportunity. Uh, bless C. Lotus and Donna for, for always giving me uh, the opportunity to present on topics that I'm passionate about, but also um, I feel is quite lacking in regards to uh, what's out there in terms of uh, content to learn more on. I mean, certainly there's plenty of numerology out there and there's plenty of Chinese medicine out there, but to have the two kind of merge together is is pretty pretty rare from what I've seen. So yeah, let's get my screen up. I just find it. Oops. Oh. I keep forgetting I've got that um, screen up on the back. Let's try that again. I've got to find it again. Sorry. <laughs> there we go. Lovely. All right. So, yes, welcome. And so what we're going to go through today is um, split up into a range of different sections. We'll get to that in just a moment. But as I like to do, I do a little quote to start with. And this one's um, one I did myself. So. I have this thing in my mind called a thought cemetery or a spirit burial ground. Everything that has defined me, made me who I am today is there. These thoughts have tombstones and their titles are on those stones as labels. As I wander through my thought cemetery, I spy the different tombstones. I stop, examine, remember, reflect and acknowledge. I place a nice flower at the base of the stone and move on. None of my past experiences should be labeled as good or bad because they got me to my present me, to my beautiful, amazing me. And I thank them all for this. This, 
I, I like to frame frame um, ideas that come into my mind, uh, concepts that are in my mind um, with kind of labels, I guess, to try to get a sense of, of what it is and what it might um, mean. And so this has been something that's been sort of bumbling around for quite a few years now in terms of me getting a better sense of, of my life experience and, and what's got me to where I am today. And understanding that everything good or everything bad, we, we give them these labels, but have they been effective in regards to getting us to where we are today? So in fact, should they all be considered relevant and important? And even the bad experiences that we would label as bad, if we didn't have them, would we be where we are today? Or would we be somewhere completely different? And I guess for me, that's helped me try to make sense of, of various parts in my life that have been less than ideal. For those that have been to some of my workshops already, know that um, that first 19 odd years of my life was hardly ideal. And when I look back at that, <clears throat> they're part of that thought cemetery as well. They're still part of what's got me to here. And I just think that it's not supposed to be a morbid thing. It's supposed to be a, I'm not picturing this dark, um, scary Hollywood style movie cemetery with um, ghosts and things. I'm picturing a nice big open grassy um, place that's inviting. You want to go there. You want to be able to, to walk through it. And I think that's, for me, it's really helped me get a better sense of understanding myself and my experiences and helping me um, better understand who I am and where I came from. All right, let's do a short Aussie quiz. Um, so you need to put into the chat what you think the answers are. So we'll just go through them one at a time. So what do we call a singer? In, in Australia. Don't be shy. A singer? No. Not sure. A sandwich? <laughs> yeah. A sanger is a sandwich. Thank you. Sangria. Yeah, maybe not at two o'clock in the morning unless I was still out on the town. Um, it's a sandwich, thing is a sandwich, thank you. What's a pav? Any ideas? No, not a path. Pavlov, you have all the answers from your friend. You behave, Charity. <laughs> no. Uh, it, it is delicious if you like that sort of thing. I'm not particularly a big fan, which, and I think actually it might be a, might have originated in New Zealand, not Australia. It's a food, and I'm not sure if Jackie's on it, but she's just missing some a, a letter. A pav is a pavlova. Do you know what a pavlova is? Is that kind of a common um, dessert in um, America? No, it's like a um, creamy center with some fruit and stuff in the middle of it. And it's got like a, um, a crusty edge that's, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? I'll, I'll think of it and I'll get back to you on it. Um, my brain's having a special moment early in the morning. No, it's not coming to me. Meringue based, yep, yeah, all that sort of stuff. Thanks, Charity. <laughs> You can be my my wingman, wing wing lady. Um, where is Whoop Whoop? Originally from New Zealand. Thank you, Patty. So where's Whoop Whoop? Anthony's on it. Yep, middle of nowhere. Whoop Whoop a party. I <laughs> didn't see that, Benjamin. Um, that's not it. Yeah, middle of nowhere. What is um, pulling your head in? Focusing, 
I guess from a personal perspective, it could be being an ostrich, put your head down and go, being careful. Uh, I guess you could pull your own head in Alice Springs, whoop, whoop, that sort of thing. Yes, Janice. Um, you might say, pull your head in, mate. Yeah, get yourself together. Sort yourself out, mate. Come on, mate. You're better than that, mate. Come on. <laughs> get it together. Yeah, all that sort of stuff. Thank you. What's a rat bag? Your neighbour. <laughs> it depends on what type of neighbour you have, Anthony. It's not a gym bag or a backpack. Um, look, they can be kind of a rotten person, but it's kind of like a daggy way of, um, like I said to my kids, I go, you little rat bags. It's a, I guess in some ways, if it's not taken too seriously, it's a, almost a little bit of a, um, a dig at someone, but almost a term of endearment as well. Um, it's a cheeky kind of term of endearment. Thank you. Um, it could be cons construed as being a lot more than that, of course. Uh, you're a bit of a troublemaker, yeah. Okay, what's um, Ridgy Ditch? Dodgy, no. That bloke Davo, he's Ridgy Ditch. No. Edgy, no. A musical instrument, okay. So didgeridoo is a musical instrument. I can see where you're going there. That's not it either. Um, no, that's not right either. It's Ridgy Didge is um, someone who's considered to be, um, you could say genuine or just a good bloke. A Davo, he's Ridgy Didge, he's a good bloke, he's genuine. I can't say it's the most common, um, probably Aussie slang that we use anymore, but that's something that I grew up with. Um, I grew up in country towns, uh, small country towns, and that was quite a common phrase. And when I moved to uh, Brisbane, which is a, a larger city, a lot of people thought I was weird. So even just within Australia, it was probably slang more in terms of the outback out in Whoopal rather than um, in in um, um, the main cities, or the big smoke. Um, what's a tanty? Nope, not an old person. Beer and lemonade, <laughs> that's a shandy. <clears throat> but yes, thank you, Benjamin. Pretty sexy woman, no. Child's tantrum, yeah, tanty's a tantrum. Go and have a tanty, you having a tanty. Yep. Um, although I, you can, don't have to be a child to have a tanty. I have tanties sometimes. You probably remember that yesterday I had a tanty when I got in the car a few days ago when there was no petrol and I was running late for somewhere. Um, what's a wedgie? <laughs> I was wondering if that was something that was, um, yeah, maybe not so much Aussie slang. Yeah, it's very well put, Alisa. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you could get a wedgie from your budgie smugglers. That's correct, Sam. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Um, what are we doing when we have a squiz? No, not a nap. Not a hug. Squiz. Okay, I can see how that... No, I'm not having a fit. <laughs> I love the answers. <laughs> Pizza. Um, no, none of those things. If you're having a squiz at something, you are um, looking at something. I'm going to have a squiz at that. Um, so it might be that you're um, going to go and um, watch a movie at the cinemas or something. I'll go and have a squiz at that movie, that type of thing. And then holy snap and duck legs, that fella got bit by a bloody great croc. 
My kids watch Bluey and I learned Dunny is toilet and fart is a fluffy. Yes, I call it a fluffy in Bluey. <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, so um, what's happening down here at number 10? Holy snapping duck's legs. That fellow got bit by a bloody great croc. Wow, yeah. Oh, no. Yep. Crikey. Why do we have so many different ways of saying struth and crikey and holy mackerel and golly gosh and all this sort of stuff bitten by a big crocodile? Very good. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate that. Thank you for amusing me. If you're here in a couple of days' time for the eight extraordinary festivals, <laughs> I've got another 10 on day one and another 10 on day two. It's just never ending. It's, um, I don't know, do we have too much time in Australia uh, coming up with all these weird ways to say something? Okay, so what do we got today? It is pretty um, rapid fire in the first part. This is revision from part one and two that were a month ago. Uh, if you've not seen um, those workshops, I would encourage you to go back and watch them because this is much more a, a one hour-ish kind of summary of the arrows. Whereas the, um, the one a month ago spent, I think about four hours going through all of the arrows, <clears throat> including what they are, how they work, how you work them out. So these are the arrows that we'll go through. Each of the two in a row have the same point combination because they are either, they're all along the same line, the same pathway. So I've got a <clears throat> croaky throat again. Then after the first break, we will again whip through the five element archetypes. This was something done earlier in the year uh, through eLotus where it was a seven part series, uh, which we did midweek rather than a, a weekend and we spent uh, i think basically about an hour and a half or so per per archetype so we really teased it out spent our time this again will be more like about an hour an hour and a half or so going through this um, more swiftly just again to lay the platform for what comes later third part is the same thing going through the five spirits again around about that sort of hour or so which again was also part of that series earlier this year. And then we get into sort of how you merge the concept. So I guess the idea ultimately in any style of um, treatment that you construct, you're probably trying to come at your acupuncture point combination or your treatment through a range of different um, areas. You probably have your diagnosis, you have signs and symptoms you're looking to treat, and you're trying to tie in a whole range of different ideas into one treatment or one acupuncture point combination. And that is what we're doing here in terms of showing you how you can merge numerology concepts with five element archetypes, five spirits, there's quite a few combinations that are available. And throughout this weekend, you've got all of the point combinations already on the tables. And I'm showing you some examples of how you, you merge them all together. And then if you've got a patient that has um, a particular numerology ruling number and you want to merge it with a particular archetype, five element archetype, then this part shows you how you would go about doing that by giving, I think it's about six or seven examples all up. So that at the end of it, hopefully you get this sense, of, okay, I know how I can construct that myself. So you're putting it together. I show you the steps and then you can go off and do that yourself. So when your patient comes in and you do their numerology and you do their archetype system sort of diagnosis, it might require you to sort of um, go away, work out what treatments you might construct for them the next time they come in 
like going back through the slides, pulling out the, the different point combinations and then putting them together and looking at the connections. So I'll show you the process of how that works. And then there's a quick um, chat about, I guess the origins of emotions from um, Greek mythology and the origins of other um, aspects of human life, which is part of that Pandora's box story. Um, and then we look at some of the point combinations that we have touched on throughout this weekend. So sometimes we only have one slide, like crown and third eye, it's just reminding you of what it is, talking about the value quickly, four gates, same thing really quick. We spend a little bit more time on some of the other concepts like kidney spirit gate, we always have points for it, but we don't really spend any time talking about what they are. So that's what's in that section. And then we finish off with, uh, at the end of the day, a more in-depth look at the concept of the self, self-esteem and how we would treat that with Chinese medicine um, and how that sort of, I guess it's that extra tie-in with archetype systems and personality types and mental health issues and sort of giving you a context of how you can tackle that. And then it's the same thing. If you've got a patient with poor self-esteem, then if you do their numerology and maybe their five element archetype system, and you put those tables of treatment side by side, and then you look at this self-esteem side of things, again, put another little table and you look at the three treatments and you might do them over three separate treatments, or you might try to merge them together into one or two treatments. Um, I think that the, the value here is that, again, we, we tend to under, um, we don't spend enough time looking at this concept. And there's a few ways to look at it. And that's what we'll look at in that section as well. So there's actually quite a lot to get through today. So um, brace yourself <laughs> in a good way. So again, APCs are acupuncture point combinations, point prescriptions, treatment formulas. The dates of birth when they're written, they're written as the 27th of July, 1986 or 0727-1986. Obviously, depending on where you live, that could just as easily be 27th of the 7th, 1986. Um, so I'm trying to write it down in two separate ways for um, to um, assist whoever it is, wherever you're watching it from, if you're not just always using that system, say, if you're in America, because in Australia, we would use the 27-7-1986. These slides for arrows are referenced through those textbooks. Not every single one of those has the arrows in them, but they have still themes of numerology that help you to understand different um, concepts within that numerology system. So the arrows, there's 16 of them in total. And we will give you a date of birth example, the image of what the arrow looks like, quick definition, and then a balancing or regulating treatment. So the arrows are in, um, like there's a connection between them, whether they're full or empty. And that is determined by what line they're on. And this will make more sense if you've not done this before, as we start to go through what each arrow is and you see the images. So in terms of the arrows, you basically work it out using that little chart on the right. <clears throat> and you put your date of birth into the chart. And I'll give you three examples of that in just a minute. But basically, again, if you're like 10, 10, 19, 73, then you look across to the chart, you know where all those numbers are, do a blank chart. So have that chart there, do a blank chart with no numbers, and then you add your numbers into it. And so then you look to see <clears throat> what numbers are missing, what numbers are there, would you win a noughts and crosses game, 
Uh, would you lose? <clears throat> Are there full lines, empty lines, that sort of thing? Zeros don't go anywhere. Um, so they're just left out. So for me, because I'm the tenth of the tenth, then I would have two zeros that don't go into that chart. <clears throat> so you're looking for rows of all numbers or no numbers. So here's an example of where there would be um, a chart with a full line of four, five, and six. So that would be considered a full arrow. <clears throat> so an example of that in terms of the date of birth would be the 5th of the 30, 31st of the 5th, 1959. And you basically put the numbers into that chart. So you can see the first one is a zero. So it goes, there's nowhere. <clears throat> then there's a five. So you put a five in there. Then there's a three. So it comes up here. Then you put a one down here. And then another one. Oh my goodness, my throat. <clears throat> then a nine, then a five back here again, and then another nine. And then you look to see, okay, have I got any lines? Have I got any empty lines? So you can see there's no full line between one, two, and three, because the two's missing. There's no line in the middle between four, five, and six. And there's no seven, eight, nine line. There is a one, five, nine line. There's nearly a three, five, seven line, but not quite. And there's no lines across ways. So the only arrow they have is this 159 arrow. And that means something. Whereas a row that has no numbers present is considered an empty arrow. And I'll put that as a green arrow, whereas the full arrows will be red. An example of that, this is my birthday. So you can see I've got the four corners covered, but then no numbers anywhere else. So you can see with that one again, it's the 10th, the 10th, 1973. So I've got a one and then a zero goes nowhere. Another one, then a zero, another one, then over here a nine, then a seven, then a three. So if I look here, I've got no full lines, but I've got these two empty ones across the middle in both directions. And we'll look at what those represent. And this is an example of my middle daughter, Olivia. 5th of August 2005. She's an interesting one because all her numbers go across the middle and she doesn't have any anywhere else. So she's got essentially two empty ones, two empty arrows and one full arrow. And that's possible for some people as well. They can have full arrows, empty arrows. Sometimes you have no empty ones. I talked about the patient yesterday that had four full arrows, yet was had severe anxiety, panic attacks, phobias, fears. Um, you know, it was, it was this whole um, area that she wasn't even aware that she had all these strengths. So let's go through them as we power into this section. Protecting my timing. So let me just quickly check. Maybe lung 10 for croaky throat. Thank you, Randy. It's because I'm having an iced coffee and it's got milk in it. And um, that's just making my throat. Um, but it's because I can't start the coffee machine at two o'clock in the morning. That would be a little bit unfair on the family. So anyway, um, arrow of determination is the first one. And you can see here, the person has a lot of numbers there but they actually only have the one arrow, which is the arrow of determination. And every person born from January 1, 1950 through to the end of 1959, every single person born actually had this arrow, the 1950s, one, nine, five, whatever. So for 10 years, everyone on the planet had this arrow of determination. So for that decade, we've got people coming through that are very determined individuals, but you can have this arrow, you know, no matter what year you're born, it would just be made up through a different uh, number system. You are a person that's determined and persistent. This determination can be achieved via patience, endurance and planning, but it can also be achieved swiftly with drive and planning on the go. And that's, something that not everyone has. Some people are much better at 
stepping out the process and then doing it or other people are better at just embracing something and working it out as they go whereas this person has the capacity to do either they're like the perfect army general where they can plan out what they think could be every conceivable attack that the opposing army is going to come at them with but then they can be adaptable when that army is attacking and make decisions quickly so that's quite a unique skill set that's not really uh, particularly common people tend to be much more one or the other rather than both this determination tends to mean people with this full arrow have very distinct likes and dislikes this should not be mistaken for stubbornness or selfish behavior they are who they are and this determination if harnessed correctly will help them achieve a measurable success in life but just be careful that this determination doesn't become the only driving force in your life pay attention to when there are large roadblocks preventing your determination when trying to achieve your goals so you can see there that even though it's this kind of perceived to be this amazing arrow that you know probably a lot of people would like to have if they don't it's it's a crutch if you're using it all the time and you don't you're not more holistic in your life and it's the only thing that you use it's your fallback position all the time because that's what the full arrows are they're like the superhero cape and at any given point you can just duck, duck into the phone booth and out you come with your arrow determination cape and away you go that's assuming you can find a phone booth anywhere these days of course um but that's the thing just be careful that it's not the only driving force because if it's the only thing that you do it becomes an imbalance so rather than it be this thing that's amazing you overuse it and it actually becomes quite detrimental to your overall um, achievements and health and well-being and again if you're really pushing for something and you think oh, i have every right to get this thing and you're not noticing the roadblocks then that's not particularly um, beneficial for you either either and if you do have roadblocks block step back look to see what your that your determination is flowing with universal energy rather than against it if everything is pointing to stepping away from a task reassessing and starting again coming at it from a slightly different angle then do that you know if you're balanced with this arrow of determination you're recognizing this and you're adapting on the run anyway it's like that army general where the the opposite army decides to not be following the rules and they're attacking in a slightly different uh, manner to what you're expecting and so this is unusual but you can adapt um, and make those changes come at it from a different angle so it's the same regulating treatment for the next arrow which is the missing line um, whereas this is the full line it's still considered to be the same um, flavor it's like the arrow itself whether it's there or not still has um, an ethereal kind of nature to it so regardless of whether it's it's a full arrow of strength or an empty arrow that's considered a weakness it's still that same flavor which is that we look at treating the wood the water and the metal elements so you can see as of like yesterday we've got our kidney spirit gate points kidney 26 is wood as well as metal and kidney 27 is the water metal so we're covering all three elements with two acupuncture points do 20 being the highest point on the body is really good for wood but it also helps to bring the energy up out of the ground if we've got those concrete boot concrete thinking so it lifts the energy up makes you more floaty but not too floaty because that's what can happen if metal and water get too strong they tend to drive down into the earth and you are getting stuck down in there 
rather than the earth being where the action is, you actually get this of these concrete boots where everything just gets hard and heavy and slow moving, whereas you want to be agile and mobile. So do 20 helps lift that up as well. So in theory, in this particular situation would also help with metal and water. Um, wood and water um, are getting some priorities in terms of the back shoe points, whereas metal gets its priority through the Yuan fourth point. So wood, I've chosen the liver back shoe point. If you felt that they needed a lot more of a gallbladder hit um, for their hour of determination, then go to bladder 19 instead of bladder 18. Bladder 23 is for kidneys. Lung nine is obviously the one source point of the lungs, which is metal. Again, if you felt like they needed more of a, a large intestine um, hit, more of a yang power hit, then you could potentially do the Yuan source point on the large intestine channel, which is large intestine four. It depends on whether you believe that the Yuan source point on the yang channels on the arm actually treat the organs or just the opposite end of the channel. The large intestine four, small intestine four, San Jiao four are three Yuan source points that are often talked about as being more treating the opposite end of the channel, which is more the, obviously the face, sense organs, maybe a little bit of neck and shoulder tension, that sort of thing, but not so good for their organs. I disagree. I think that their Yuan source points still are very good to treat their organs. Um, so it's, I guess, a personal choice. Liver three and kidney three are you are source points, obviously for liver and kidney. Once again, if you're thinking you want to change it to a different organ within those same elements, that's entirely up to you. It's your patient that makes that decision in the end, isn't it? Like you diagnose them and your diagnosis dictates whether you would adjust this point combination or not. Now I'm not going to spend that same amount of time uh, on all the point combinations, but I always like to just early on in any workshop, just lay that platform. And then spleen six is the three yin connector, which is the spleen, liver and kidney channels. And so in this instance, that's going to be very helpful for the wood and the water elements. And then the arrow of resignation or procrastination is the missing arrow there of the one, the five, the nine. Now, this arrow actually didn't occur for anyone on the planet from the year 888 until the year 2000. So it's not been around for a long time, but uh, children that are born from 2000 onwards could have this arrow. Um, none of my girls have this arrow. They have other arrows, but not that one. So it's a bit negative what's coming across here. And I, I guess when you read about it, you, you're coming at it from limited experience because it hasn't existed over a thousand years. So um, I think it's going to be an arrow that becomes more understand, will understand it more over the next, you know, 50 to 100, 200 years as it starts to appear more often. So really, unless you've got a patient born after the year 2000, of which we've got more of them coming in now, of course, um, goodness, you could even have 22 year old coming into your clinic, remarkable. Where does the time go? I sound, <laughs> I sound, oh dear, I sound like my parents. Um, so this person could be completely resigned to their fate. They may lack motivation and could come across as cowardly, fearful, idle, or timid, maybe a resolute, indifferent, disinterested. It's a watch this space kind of thing. And the reality, yeah. So it's, it's saying if you can learn to be diligent and to persevere with every task you start, then you can learn to follow through with job that you set yourself. And that gives you a sense of achievement. And that goes a long way to ensuring you do the next one. It's like you get an adrenaline hit when you complete the task and you go, oh, 
I like that feeling. And so you do it again. So people with this empty arrow may not be very good at following through with things, but they're often very good at coming up with ideas for new things. And so they should learn to appreciate this part of themselves as being a valuable asset in the world. Because empty arrows are areas for you to work on to improve aspects of your life or not improve. <clears throat> They're challenges. It's like the universe has said, you're born on this date uh, and this is going to produce this type of arrow, which will either give you a strength or a weakness. Then if you use the strength too much, that becomes a weakness. And if you work through your weaknesses, it can become a strength. So you can still look at them as being opportunities. I mean, I certainly didn't think that my arrow of hypersensitivity or my arrow of frustration was a very nice thing to have for the first oh, 20, even 40 years of my life. Um, but it's something that I've come to understand can add value to, to my experience and work through it to, for it to become a strength ultimately in my life. It's the same point combination as the previous one. So no matter whether you have the arrow of determination or the arrow of resignation, the treatment structure's the same. When your patient presents, you diagnose them, you look at this list, if they've got this arrow and just make slight adjustments based on what you think best suits your patient. It might be perfect just like this, or make some adjustments. The next one is the hour of spirituality. This is a really funny line because both um, the full and empty arrow actually have some similarities. So this arrangement creates a deep spiritual awareness, which is the vital basis for balanced practical philosophy of life. Makes sense. The arrow is called spirituality. It's developed by personal experience and research rather than via advice from others. And then they practically apply the spirituality to their, to their daily life, which is often full of challenging endeavors. It's almost like the universe is throwing everything at them, including the kitchen sink to see how they react and respond. So it's not like they become spiritual through growing up having everything you want, almost being a bit lazy and indifferent, the universe is going to challenge you. And as you get challenged, you reach out to try to get a sense of what's going on. Why is this happening to me? You know, is there something else out there? And so they can get quite philosophical or quite um, religious. It's their way of making sense of, of those challenges. And then from there, that's their kind of chosen spiritual pursuit. And they use that to survive, succeed, and thrive. So this combination, when you look at it, look at what's the most dominant. I mean, fire's involved in this, but there's only two points for it. Whereas with water, we've got one, two, three, four, five. So it's clearly more important in terms of the value of using water-based points for the arrow of spirituality and metal has one, two, three. The water is clearly the primary element that we're targeting for arrow of spirituality and the next one, and to a lesser extent, metal and fire. So in this instance, we're, again, we've got kidney spirit gate points. <coughs> I do apologize. <clears throat> I'll be pushing various points underneath the, <laughs> underneath the camera so you can't see. So we've got the fire, kidney spirit gate point, kidney 25, and then kidney 27, which does water and metal. So we've gone with back shear points for lungs and kidneys. <clears throat> And I think that that's probably a better choice here. I, I, I get that you could do large intestine and urinary bladder. Then we've got lung five. The value there is that it's actually a water point on a metal channel. 
So you've got two elements being treated with the one point. Heart seven obviously is one of the best points in my opinion to treat Shen based conditions, fire element based conditions. And then we've got kidney three, which is the Yuan source point for kidneys and bladder 66, which is water point on water channel. That's water on water. Well, they call that an orary point. You could do that for kidney as well. That'd be kidney 10. But I like the Yuan source point there for both kidney and heart. It's two Yuan source points and they're good connection because the heart and the kidneys are Xiao Yin connected um, um, organs. The Xiao Yin is heart and kidney together. And by using similar points, you get that kind of <clears throat> lock where the body goes, oh, I know what this is. And it gets in and, and gets the root takes charge and starts the results, seriously. <clears throat> the next one is the arrow of skepticism or inquirer. Now, it's kind of somewhat um, a misnomer if that's the right word. It's the person will be a skeptic but what they're skeptical of is whatever they don't understand religiously, scientifically, or philosophically. So if the person embraces Western medicine and Christian doctrine, then they will potentially be skeptical of complementary or alternative medical practices and religions that don't link in with their Christian views. But the opposite also applies, meaning that someone that's brought up in a household that uses natural medicines and our fans of new age texts and authors will likely be skeptical of mainstream medicine and religious practices. So it's, I guess what you, you start off with that will challenge you moving forward. Now, whether you stay with that same skepticism through your whole life, or maybe it challenges you to look at the other side and possibly even change to the other side. It's what it's where you start. So you're starting off as being potentially skeptical of the opposite of what your experience is, which will either keep you that way or it'll challenge you to go, well, I need to know what this other thing is and you learn more about it. And at the end you might go, yep, I'm still happy where I am. Or you essentially embrace or merge those other concepts into your life as well. They can use their five senses to the point of overuse. It's the same combination of points for both um, of those arrows. The arrow of intellect is the next one, and it's a full line across three, six, and nine. Now we talk about two types of intellect in Chinese medicine, don't we? We've got the pre-heaven, and the post heaven, the pre heaven intellect is part of your water element, your G um, spirit, and part of your kidneys and your kidney jing. And it's the knowledge that you are inherently born with. It's the stuff you just know without having learnt it first. You were essentially never taught it, you just somehow know it. Now, of course, it's in probably extremely difficult for us to be able to prove that this knowledge exists, but it's part of what the ancestors, our ancestors have passed on to us at the point of our conception. So it's the, where they're giving us information about the world. So in certain areas, as we grow up, we will just inherently be better at some things than others. We'll learn things faster in some areas than others because it's not like we're learning it for the first time, we're almost being reminded of it. Whereas the post heaven intellect is more earth, more spleen, more ye. And that's what you learn by your senses after you're born. This is something that we can um, prove exists. And this arrow works on both of those but it also works on your fire and your Shen 
through uh, short-term, long-term memory as well. So you essentially have three elements that you're working on for the arrow of intellect and also the missing arrow will have that same grouping. People with the arrow of intellect tend to gravitate towards pursuits that challenge them on an intellectual level. Makes sense. This can mean they appear aloof, indifferent, or lack feelings towards others, particularly those with a lower IQ. That might be the perception. Um, and it might be what is actually the case. It's Sometimes it's just that they've got an interest in peers. They're vital for their intellectual development. And so it's not, an, it's a hard one because some of them can, some people with the arrow of intellect can be quite blunt in the kind of almost get out of my way, you know, you underling, I'm, I'm above you and I'm striving to be, wanting to be even better. So I'm going to attach myself to people that are above me and learn and learn and learn to the point I'm above them. And then they become kind of almost useless to me as I continue my climb up the intellectual ladder. And they just basically tread on the people below them. Um, it's not like they're being deliberately rude it's just they've learned what they need from you and it's time to cut tithe and we're moving on. And it'll just be better for everyone if I do it. You know, Band-Aid, rip it off, let's move on. Others can be a little bit more gentle in their approach, um, but that is something that they do potentially have to be careful with. Do they have to? I mean, in the end, you know, it's, you still have to look after yourself but we do live in a world with a lot of other people in it as well. So it's a juggling act, I believe. So water's the primary there. You can see it's got one, two, three, four, five main points. Fire has one, two, three. Earth has one, two, three, four. So water's the dominant one. Again, in good news, a lot of those kidney spirit gate points do more than just the one element. And kidney 22 does water and fire. Kidney 23 is earth. We've got back shoe for heart and back shoe for kidneys. Again, I think they're probably the best choice because of the fact that they're very good for treating memory-based conditions, possibly better than say a different fire organ or a different water organ. Heart seven is good as well as kidney three. They're in the last grouping, but here the extra value is that they're earth points and we want to treat the earth in particular with this grouping of um, numbers, this arrow. We've got uh, kidney one, so it's the wood point, which we don't necessarily need to worry about it being a wood point, but it's a really good point because it's going to ensure that it lifts us up into action and movement and we don't get too stuck in processes and in um, thinking and not moving, it regulates the energy between um, getting stuck in thinking and not moving forward. You need the balance between thinking and action. So kidney one ensures energy is going up and also the energy is coming down. So that thoughts and intellect and all up in the head will come down and create action, but at the same time that we also stop acting stop action and get back up into our head and analyze and process again. That's that um, balance point between those things. And then spleen six is good because it treats the earth and the water. The arrow of poor memory uh, is, as I said, the missing three, six and nine. Uh, Olivia has that one. Um, and I believe that Jesse has that one too. Yeah, she does. So Jessie's my youngest. I've done all my arrows for my family here. So Jessie's got that one as well. So my two youngest, except they've actually got pretty amazing memories. So it's one of those weird ones. It's another rather new arrow. Because again, if you look back here, it says 
people born from 1889 to 1999 couldn't have this arrow. So it's another arrow that come back in after being away for a long time. And I think it's going to take us a while to get a better sense of really what this arrow is all about. So it says here that when you learn more about this empty arrow, you learn that the poor memory actually starts to develop later in life rather than earlier in life. But considering most people seem to lose some of their memory later in life anyway, it's a bit perplexing. When you delve deeper, you learn that apart from poor memory, these people can also have trouble learning, particularly in the current school environment that we have developed in the West. Granted, um, that is certainly the case. Um, with my two daughters that have this arrow, they're very intelligent uh, and they're good learners, but not perfectly within the, um, the current school environment. And I think actually what's going to happen over the next thousand years is that the schooling system will, will actually evolve and change to suit uh, a, a new style of um, human that's being born into the world. They might be forgetful, learn slowly, have poor concentration, be vague, appear quite disinterested. You know, if you can keep them stimulated and interested in a project, they're much more likely to sustain a strong level of memory into their more elderly years. Again, it hasn't been around for a long time. So we need to, we don't have any elderly people that have this arrow currently alive. Currently alive, the oldest person that can have this arrow was 22. So this is really going to be a watch this space kind of arrow. Same treatment. Just picking my timing of it all. This one is the arrow of emotional balance, two, five and eight across the middle. And again, it's a bit like your classic sort of numerology, which I touched on yesterday, where it, it can be an archetype system for some people where they grow into their numbers and they grow into their arrows. And it's like a, an archetype system that you evolve into, whereas some archetype systems that I've read, it's kind of like you, you, you have it already, it's there, like Myers-Briggs, you know, you're extroverted or introverted. Now you might evolve throughout the decades, but once you've filled out that form, when you're old enough to be able to complete a Myers-Briggs personality test, then it's basically telling you what you are. And then from there, like you might evolve, but you might stay exactly like that. And that's fine. And numerology can give you that too. A lot, often what happens with numerology is you tend to evolve into your numbers and your arrows. And so with this one, the arrow of emotional balance, they are actually anything but that in the earlier stages of their life. Again, if you're a child, they're not emotionally balanced. You know, that's just, you know, it's, it's a, a process for them to understand the world that they're in and <laughs> what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. And that would be dictated, I guess, by, you know, who's in their life and what the rules are and all that sort of thing. It does suggest it can persist until at least past that 27th year. So you've gone through three nine year cycles. So you've come through that 27th year, you hit your 28th year and potentially you are, um, you've come through that first aspect of your life. And from there, potentially you are more emotionally balanced, emotionally stable. But up until that point, you could have been thrown a lot of challenging um, stuff for you to mold how you uh, handle emotional behavior. I mean, that's what's needed. It's like first comes the chaos and then comes the peace. You know, what's going to prompt you to be emotionally balanced if you don't get thrown stuff that forces all of the different emotions to be relevant at various points in your life? 
People with this full arrow have been through a lot and this makes them exceptionally good healers. If they can harness this power, it will help hundreds and thousands of other people. Which is really exciting to think. And this is what happens with numerology, like any archetype system. The archetype system will have what your, um, maybe your preferred careers will be. And that's no different with numerology. And someone with an emotional balanced arrow will often gravitate towards um, healing careers. People with this full arrow can tend to be a little too serious for their own good. It's almost as if by ensuring there is emotional balance, they've removed everything in their lives that could create drama and stress. Now, yes and no. Um, it's not like they necessarily remove those things from their lives. Some, and they've not transcended it either, but they're just, some people with this arrow just get it like they've got their own um, thought symmetry with all the different emotions and they recognize them and they go, oh, I know you. I'll oh, thank you for showing me what you are again. Bless you. I'll, I'll talk to you later. And then you you wave goodbye and, and on you move. It's like you you can understand the emotion, appreciate it for what it is, its flavor, and then you can move through it. And I think that that's what people with this arrow are actually very good at doing. But if they are really serious, then make, you know, they do need to look at creating a bit more of a balance there. You don't have to take life so seriously. Be a bit more daggy. Um, get some more amusement into your life potentially. Again, the kidney spirit gate points we've gone with, um, it's fire and earth is predominantly the case for this particular arrow and the next one. You can see with earth, there's one, two, three, four, five, and there's four fire. So it's pretty balanced in terms of the elements that we're targeting. So back shoes for heart and spleen. You could consider a stomach, if you're wanting perhaps a bit more of a power kick, you could consider even bladder 14 for pericardium if you're wanting to, if they're too serious, maybe you want the court jester. So bladder 15 is the heart, the emperor. Bladder 14 is the pericardium or court jester. So maybe instead you choose bladder 14 for someone that's a bit too serious because the court jester will entertain you and make you feel joy and you have a bit of a laugh. And so that's an option for you, which means that if you believe that that's a good approach, you might even change heart seven to pericardium seven. It's still an earth point on a fire channel, but once again, it's the Yuan source point of the court jester. Or maybe heart seven and pericardium seven and then leave Sanjiao 6 out or some variation. I guess if you've got pericardium and Sanjiao there, that's quite good because they're yin and yang partners. So I can see some little adjustments there that depending on what is going on with your patient, you can make those little changes. And that's the idea always with these point combinations. I say it all the time. Th this is a a good place to start and it might be perfect but maybe change a few little things around if you feel like you'll get better value for your patient take it a step further maybe you put ren 17 in on the chest you know that's the front move point of the pericardium court jester shake them up a bit and see you know what what happens and then you've got the two earth of earth points, spleen three, earth of earth, stomach 36, earth of earth. And this is the arrow of hypersensitivity. This is one that I have. This was, I mean, I still have the arrow, but it's a bit of a train wreck arrow. It's an empty arrow. So it does um, throw up a lot of challenges. It's almost, 
you can almost call it the arrow of the empath. I think people throw that word empath around a lot more than they ever used to. I think in the past, people would think it's a bit woo woo and you'd never want to claim that you were an empath. Nowadays, it seems to be the, the new favorite saying, oh, I'm an empath. And, oh, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's a difficult one. You don't have to be an M. If you're an empath, you don't necessarily have this arrow, by the way. But a lot of empaths do have this arrow. And so what's going on? There's basically the hypersensitivity comes across as two distinct features. You have what I call a justice meter. This is another one of my little labels for something. And acute sensitivity to others' views about you, hypersensitive. The justice meter is a finely tuned sensitivity to universal energy. It can pick up on significant world events unfolding without the need for social media to inform them that something bad is going down. And the justice meter, for me, it's like um, one of those meters that builds and builds and builds and then it cracks and, and you blow your top. And that's kind of what I always image this um, arrow as being a bit about is that you've got this, this sense of justice and, and understanding the difference between right and wrong and right action, wrong action and the injustices that can happen to people around you. So people with an arrow of hypersensitivity um, can also be really good healers. It's on that same line as the emotional balance, which are good healers. Because they have this real sense of, of wanting to help other people so that other people feel better. And, you know, the person with this arrow feels good like that. What they hate is for anyone to be hurting, even down to animals hurting. You know, it just all feels wrong. And if there's injustices, the meter builds and builds and builds, and then you crack it. Some people crack it by getting angry. Some people crack it by getting incredibly sad. Some people crack it by retreating from the world and putting the covers up over their head in bed and telling everyone to F off. It's, there's different ways that you can blow your top but that's what can happen with this arrow. The acute sensitivity is real or perceived. So there might be this real um, dislike of, of, of you from other people, and you are acutely sensitive of this with this arrow. Some people, you don't care what other people think about you. You just kind of go, yep, whatever, that's your opinion. Um, you're entitled to it, but I'm not gonna take that on. This person will take that on and it can be perceived you might think that someone doesn't have a good opinion of you but you don't know unless they've actually specifically said it to you how do you know but you can still take that on and you think oh this person doesn't like me this person doesn't like me and you get offended hurt upset and then in general you can be offended hurt upset over the smallest things especially when it's targeted at them. Again, it's, they're in tune with universal energy. Thoughts hurt just as much as a physical or verbal action. So their perception of other people's views of them can be accurate because they're picking up on the thoughts through universal energy, but that's not always going to be the case in terms of their perception can be a bit skewed. So same treatment as the previous one. Arrow of practicality. Just have a quick look at the questions that you've got here. Yeah, erase all numbers. Yes, thank you for some of you helping out there. I wish I had a superhero cape. Yeah, I mean, you are what you are and you're super and you can have superhero capes. Um, 
It's a blessing to be brought up in diversity. It helps you seek truth and see timeless and accountable archetypes like numerology. <laughs> I don't want a superhero cape now. Um, could the memory be referring to institutional memory, which could be an advantage to forward thinking and problem solving? Let me think about that one, Marianne. More dementia to come in future generations. Well, that's, that's the thing, we're, we're not sure. Maybe they're not stuck in their heads. They'll come more from their hearts. Yeah, it's quite possible. First Saturn cycle. Yeah, we were sort of talking about that. Buddha attained realization at age 28. Okay. I have some memory of that now that you say that in my head, um, but I couldn't have said that I, that I knew that necessarily until you show me that it's like the memory of something you'd forgotten hour of practicality i'll look at the q a in, in a minute as well so the hour of practicality this is the full hour of practicality which will manifest via the physical they're extremely gifted with their hands making them exceptionally good musicians artists or with any form of trade anything creative is where their heart generally lies you're probably getting a sense of the elements, the five elements that are involved in this one. They also tend to love nature and so outdoor careers that require physical work that is of a practical nature will suit them down to the ground. They can get caught up in our materialistic world and take things for granted. But they are kind and will often want to help others, but this can make them poor judges of character. They do tend to give people a lot of chances, but if they do get burnt too many times, they may pull back and become quite stubborn and selfish. And I don't think that's unreasonable, actually. I don't have this arrow, but I just think that's, that's reasonable. How many times do you want to give someone a chance? So we look at it, it's wood and metal. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six wood, one, two, three, four, five metal. So pretty even within those two. And that's that Hun Po dynamic, the Hun, the artistic, poetic uh, part of ourselves. The metal is the Po, which is the action, getting down and dirty in the earth. So you can see why these two make sense in terms of this arrow. Do 20 highest point um, gives you that creative spark, uh, but it also makes sure that you do come back out of the earth at times, you come back out of that action in order to get that creative spark back and then ground it back into action again, which is in the Po. Kidney 24 and 26, uh, metal and wood and a little bit of both. It's almost like the Hun Po axis. You sort of can't have one without the other. So even though one might be up and the other one down, there's still a bit of it. It's not like they just completely disappear. And you look to try to create that sort of give and take with that um, horn po axis or a wood metal axis. That's where you put the image of earth in the middle with fire and water top to bottom and the wood metal side to side. That's that axis there. Back shoes for lung and uh, liver. I think that's a good approach. You got bladder 19 could be quite good here for gallbladder uh, and wood to again, create that yang momentum and movement. That would take the needles up to 19. So you might take something else out or maybe you're not going to flip your patient like we talked about yesterday. So if you're not flipping your patient, then if they're face down, you wouldn't do the kidney 24 and 26 on the chest. So that would mean there was four less needles, which would be down to 13. So you could do bladder 13, bladder 18 and bladder 19 on the back. So that's another sort of way you could look at doing it. We've got the four gates here. The four gates work really well whenever there is a Hun Po dynamic or that metal wood dynamic. So that's the four gates, large intestine, four, liver three. And then we're kind of rounding it out with 
a, a gallbladder point to create that drive and movement and energy and moving the chi. And then we've got a base level chi tonic and lung nine, yuan source point of lungs, very good to keep that base level energy humming. Because when you're very, when you got this arrow, you do a lot. And you do have to make sure that you keep your base level energy strong. So lung nine will help you there, bladder 13 will help you there, keeping good energy. Um, whereas you've got other points that will help to encourage the energy out. And then this is the empty arrow. Again, this is another, not newbie, but hasn't been around for over a thousand years. So again, people that are currently alive, the oldest person that can have this arrow would be 22. So it's a, another arrow that's a watch this space arrow. So look, it's a practical um, world we live in. And so it's time for a change. And this new bunch of children being born from 2000 onwards are just the people for the job. Why? Because they're impractical. It's like we had a thousand years from 1000 to 1999, where everyone had at least one one in their chart. Well, now we're moving into a phase where everyone has at least one two in their chart. And it's going to change the way that the world operates whether they've got this arrow or not, they inherently have a different, they're operating in a different world. So for the next thousand years, our world's going to change quite a bit. And to be fair, it needs to. We just spent a thousand years, industrial age, feeling good about changing everything out there. Let's dig crap out of the ground and let's, you know, ruin the ozone layer and all this sort of stuff. And now we're gonna go from 2000 onwards where they're more interested in what's happening inside their own bodies, changing the way that they look at themselves to feel better. So they're not so much interested in out there, they're more interested in here. And that will give the world a break. And you know, mother nature gets the breather and it will change the schooling system. It will change the way that we do our jobs. Lots of things will change. And that's what all this is saying. This is an empty arrow. If you've got this arrow, there will be challenges ahead, but that will help us. At the moment, they're being born into a world they don't understand and we don't understand them because they're different. So they could withdraw from the world. Some people will do that and they'll achieve a lot. Others will get out into the world, and keep going, and that will also be helpful. So some people with this arrow will pull back and change the world from home, from their safe place, where the others will get out into the world and we'll see them make change. And again, same point combination as the previous one. Okay, next one's the arrow of the planner. This is quite a common arrow. Skillful planning is the order of the day with this person. Everything is included here from in-depth and analytical planning that can take months and months to rapid fire and on the run planning. These could be plans that appear of little importance all the way up to grand schemes that are career defining. My oldest daughter has this one. It's really interesting the different ways that she goes about this. Because they're forever thinking up new and wonderful projects that can be quite removed from the people around them. Could be aloof, indifferent, elitist, self-centered, selfish. It's possible, but it could be that they're just so caught up in their schemes and plans that they may not consider what others are thinking and doing. So I don't necessarily agree with that in terms of, I guess, the way that my oldest daughter is behaving. She can be a little bit of that, but she's very much it's like she plans out this sort of thing and then it's show it to the world and those around them. And then we, we might do that activity or something like that. It's really fascinating watching the way the processes go, but sometimes she'll retreat 
back to her room and do that planning quietly. And that might come across as, oh, she's, Abby's gone off to her room again, you know, but it's not supposed to be looked at that way. This is just it's like we're out in the world for a bit and then we're going back and we're retreating and we're going to process in that more introverted space. And then we'll come out, we'll be extrovert, extroverted and then we'll come back and be introverted. So allow them the space to be great. Encourage them to take a break occasionally, come back out into the world. I mean, Abby's good at that. She comes back out into the world a lot, but some people will tend to retreat back. So this is again, another wood and metal one like the previous one, but it's just more metal this time than wood. It doesn't mean that a person with this arrow will be a wood archetype or a metal archetype. It just means that those two elements in a person with this arrow are more um, pronounced. So I mentioned it yesterday, Abby's an earth archetype actually, but it just shows you that she has an, an understanding of the wood and metal aspect of herself through having this arrow. So again, do 20 being the highest point gives you the energy up here when you need it, but it also grounds you into the action of the metal when needed, but not keeping you too much in concrete boots brings you up as well. So it's that movement up and down combined with kidney one, lowest point on the body. So highest point on the body, the two kidney ones, lowest point on the body, triangle of power or energy. We've got front move for, um, liver which is liver 14 front move for lungs lung one ren 17 is the front move of the pericardium but it also is the one that opens up your lungs and then we've got a kidney spirit gate point for both metal and wood we've got no back points this time you could certainly do some back points but i'm just showing you that sometimes you can do treatments that are more one-sided but still sensibly scattered needles, head, trunk, arms, legs. Lung eight is metal on metal. Large intestine one is metal on metal. And gallbladder 41 is wood on wood. So you've got lots of power within those individual points. The arrow of confusion, there's no point even talking about this one because it hasn't existed since 959 and again there's that whole issue with the that being before 1752 and the calendar system so the accuracy of the dates are possibly not correct either and it will not actually occur again until the 4th of april 4000 so who would even know <laughs> so we don't need to worry about it so the arrow of the will is four, five, and six. It is the full numbers in that space. Don't worry about the empty row here. That's just their date of birth. It turns out that they have the arrow of the will and then they have a missing arrow there as well. But we'll talk about that missing arrow later or shortly. So as the name suggests, they have a serious amount of willpower. They've got drive, determination, along with intense activity and action. When they set their mind to something, they'll be dogged, stubborn, and be extremely, they'll show extreme perseverance. They do whatever is necessary to complete their tasks, maybe even to the detriment of other things in their life, and possibly even other people's feelings. Is this accurate? It's actually not. They are very, very kind people, and they have an underlying interest in helping others, but when they're going towards a goal, it, it's like that's the all encompassing thing. When they're not driving towards these particular goals and they're more in the moderated space, then they're going to be extremely kind and helpful people. But they would prefer to help others in a quiet solitude where they can fully commit to the task at hand. That's good though, because if they're out there driving for something, um, that's an external action, whereas this can be more the internal, quieter approach. So it balances out that yin and yang. 
The willpower comes only after they've analyzed, processed and charted a course of action, thereby the commitment to complete the task comes from the knowing that what they're doing is worthwhile for themselves, but also other people. So they're achieving a lot for the greater good. So this is uh, three elements now, and you'll see there's water, earth, and wood. And because there's so much going on, what I've done is I've actually told you which ones are one-sided and which ones are bilateral. If they don't have anything written beside them, in terms of whether they're bilateral or one-sided, they are bilateral. So if you look at the ones lower down, spleen six, stomach 36, kidney one, kidney 10, they are all bilateral. But when you come up onto the trunk, front and back, it will say which ones are bilateral, which ones are left or right. The water is the dominant element in the arrow of the will, which makes sense because will power is ZHI or G, which is the spirit of the water element. And then earth and wood are more secondary. And you can see the, the points that have been chosen there. The value of water, earth and wood, spleen six, I mean, what a winner because it's doing those three channels, kidney channel, the spleen channel, the liver channel. Stomach 36 is earth of earth. Kidney 10 is water of water. And then kidney one is the wood point on the water channel. The arrow of frustration is incredibly frustrating. I have this arrow. Um, it is still, even though I'm, I understand the arrow, it still is one of my favorite words. Basically it's directed towards two areas themselves or other people frustration with themselves. Everyone on the planet has this little voice inside their heads that I call that inner critic. And with this arrow, that voice can be particularly uncomplimentary. You get stuck into them, nothing is ever good enough. And that voice lets them know about it 24 seven. As I said, that first 19 years of my life, that was just brutal. If I could have kicked that part of myself out of my body, um, I was no friend to me and that inner critic was so bad and the arrow of frustration is partially responsible for that. Frustration with those around them, because they're so self-critical, this can lead to an unrealistic expectation of other people. We should realize that frustrations could be avoided if only we learnt to appreciate people for what they are rather than what they can be or should be. And it's the same point combination. And the arrow of activity, we'll have a break shortly, is the seven, eight, and nine. As the name suggests, people with this full arrow show an increased level of activity in their day-to-day -day lives. Sometimes they show so much activity that people around them can get fatigued just by watching them go, go, go. People with this full arrow also love peace and harmony in the world and get very can get very agitated if there is conflict and fighting. They will gravitate towards jobs that keep them moving and active, particularly ones that involve the outdoors and nature, not necessarily, but certainly jobs that are active. If it's not active physical, it'll certainly be active mental or both. And the same applies to their leisure life. It's active too. In fact, it's rare for them not to be doing something. They wake, they're active, then they sleep, if they have to, repeat. I was telling you about my brother. He's a five ruling number and he's a spitting image of it. And that's quite an active number. He's got this arrow, which you can see is quite an active arrow. And he is a wood, uh, archetype which is very active and he has fire support which is very active so my brother barely ever stops and um, he's an accidental energy sucker like he just gets the energy out of the room and drags it into himself to keep him going 
and it's quite fatiguing to be around him for any length of time. And it's phenomenal what he has achieved through these different archetype systems. You can see why. They get quite irritable and show nervous tension if they sit still for too long, almost like they're ready to explode. You can feel that caged in energy, almost like the hum from power stations when you get close to them. So it's um, quite a balanced one in terms of fire and water, in terms of the mechanics of it. The fire is obviously giving them the activity side of things. Um, the thing is they still have an element of that water aspect as well. So if they've got a good balance with this arrow, they, it won't be too extreme within um, constantly on the go. They can shut down and they can use the water element side of themselves to um, plan out the next strategies, plan out the next approach, do research, analysis, um, and work out. Um, it's a bit like the same with the metal. Metal and water are very much about pulling back from the world and um, philosophizing or researching, being scientific or making something better than what it is. And the hour of activity still needs that fall off uh, aspect of themselves in order to get that charge back. If it was just all on and no off switch, it wouldn't be um, a strength arrow. Remember, this is an arrow, if I go back and look, it's a full arrow, it's a strength, it's not a weakness. If it was a weakness, then there would be too much extremes within certain areas and they become your challenges that you need to work on in your life. So what I've done here is I've got um, do 20 highest point on the body. So highest as in uh, fire or even wood, but it also lifts the water up out of the ground as well and helps to balance that energy up and down the body. Kidney 22, best point on the kidney spirit gate for fire and water together. Ren four and six for water. You could do gallbladder 25 as front mill of kidneys. I prefer Ren four and six. Ren 14 is front mill of heart, for fire. Bladder 22 is the back shoe point of the San Jiao. The San Jiao regulates fire and water, which is why that's there. San Jiao 6, fire on fire. Small intestine 5, fire on fire. And then kidney 10 and bladder, bladder 66 are water on water. And then this arrow is another new one, so we don't know. Again, the oldest person currently alive with this arrow was 22. It hasn't occurred to anyone on the planet since 1666. So really, it does exist now, and you can have 22 year olds with this arrow. It suggests inactivity, lethargy, laziness, passive, someone that's passive, they could be unmotivated, apathetic, disorganized. They have a water aspect to this arrow, which actually means that they can be extremely intelligent and really process and learn, but they're probably going to enjoy the learning um, away in their own safe space, just as much as being out in the world and learning. It's just about getting out of that hesitation stage and embracing the differences that exist in this person because they've got the fire aspect and they've got the water aspect. So this can be somewhat confusing and it's an empty arrow. So they find it difficult to understand. Whereas the full arrow of this, they just go out and do it anyway. So they've just got to learn to have that balance between having this secluded distance as well as actively living their life out in the world. They have to work on having multiple plans of action at the same time and instead try to maybe target one 
in particular, complete it, get the adrenaline kick, feel good, move on into the next one. Probably need to set goals to do that um, and show serious self-discipline, but that'll be really good for them. This is the challenge arrow. It's an empty arrow. The more they do it, the better they get at it. And it's the same treatment. So that is the end of that section. I went oh, only five minutes over time, so that's good. Okay. So um, does anyone have any questions before we have a 10 minute break? Why is it that some twins are so alike and other twins are so different? You could go into the time of birth. Again, you can take numerology all the way into single digits on any aspect of numbers. I don't have a lot of experience with twins in terms of um, friends or family members. So I'm not really sure. And I haven't had... The only twins I've ever had that actually came to me for treatment was actually massage. Um, so I don't, they did not have acupuncture. They did not do any form of archetypal stuff. They just came for a relaxing massage. So I don't, I don't know. Good question. Don't know the answer. All right. Well, what we'll do then is we'll take a 10 minute break. So it must be 10.36 in Los Angeles at the moment. So let's come back at 10. Oh, it's just gone over. So 10.40, 10.47. 10.47 back from your break, please. I'll see you soon. Thank you. <laughs> 